crying of joy for all of us. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom. For Jesus, Lord Jesus, is in this very room. In this very room, there's quite enough love for all the world. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all the world. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom. For Jesus, Lord Jesus, is in this very Italy in 1452. 
Though he excelled in many fields, he is remembered today because of two wonderful paintings, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. In 1494, when Leonardo was 42, he was commissioned by the Duke of Milan to decorate the dining room of the convent <coughs> church, which was the favorite shrine of the Duke's young bride. As an appropriate theme for this dining room, the painter chose the Last Supper. His painting was not intended to be a faithful reproduction of the original scene as it had taken place in the first century Palestine, but as it might have taken place in 15th century Italy. He chose what he considered the most dramatic moment of the Last Supper in this living dramatization. The 12 disciples speak their minds to themselves, to each other, and to the Lord in the light of the words which they have heard Jesus speak. Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. John the Baptist, and it was he who taught me the teachings of Jesus at Bethany beyond the Jordan. <clears throat> One day, my friend Philip came to me and said, we have found him for whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I will never forget the question I put to him that day. Did any good come out of Nazareth? I said it not in scorn, but the town was such a little, insignificant place that those of us familiar with her lanes and alleys wondered what God had placed his anointed in her midst. He simply replied, come and see. When I saw Jesus, he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. How do you know me, I asked. He replied, I saw you under the fig tree. In our country, when working mothers go into the field, they place their babies under the nearest fig tree. The large leaves shelter the babies from the hot rays of the sun. So the master was telling me he had known me since the day I was born. It was then that I confessed my faith. Rabbi, I said, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And since that time, I've served him as an apostle and a chosen disciple. And now, he says, one of us will betray him? How could that be? How could a traitor be numbered amongst his closest friends? But I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I? call me Matthew the publican. When my character changed through my relationship with Jesus, he changed my name as well. He called me one day when I was in my office collecting taxes. Follow me, he said. So I got up and I followed him. Later, I threw a feast for him in my house. Many of the disciples 
and some of my business friends were present. When the Pharisees complained that Jesus was eating with publicans and sinners, he had this to say. Those who are well have no need for a physician, only those who are sick. Since I repented and followed Jesus, I have studied our scriptures carefully and am firmly convinced that he is the fulfillment of every promise of the coming Messiah, God's anointed. Someday, I hope to write a book proving that he is the Messiah. I'll use supporting parts from our sacred scriptures and add the words he spoke about the good news of the kingdom of God. You know, it was that sermon he gave on that mountain in Galilee about three years ago. It's a new gospel and good news for all the world. And yet, he speaks of sad news, actually tragic news, that one of us is going to betray him. Who could that be? Will they suspect me? who was once a hated tax collector? Is it I? Is it I? many men bear this familiar name. I'm sometimes called James the Little or James the Lesser, being smaller in size than other men with the same name. Since my father's name is Alphaeus, I am sometimes called James, son of Alphaeus. I'll never forget the first day I saw the master. I was passing down the road close to where John was baptizing him. I was curious as to what was going on and turned aside for a closer look. I heard Jesus ask John to baptize him and John refused, but Jesus insisted. After the Lord was baptized, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And I heard a voice from heaven say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. At the end of the first year of his public ministry, the Lord chose me to be one of his twelve apostles. And since that time, I have walked with him, talked with him, and stayed with him and prayed with him, trying to find out as much about him and his heavenly father as I could. And now, one of us is to betray him? Surely it is madness for this to be so. Surely the betrayer is out of his mind. Yet, I ask myself, is it I? Is it I? Jesus, I was casting my net. And he told me to drop my net. 
follow him. My mother told me to impress your, your views on Jesus. So last week we were walking on the road to Jerusalem and I said, Lord, I'm master. May I sit on the right of, of the left when you come when you come to your kingdom? And he and he replied, James, can you drink of my cup? Can you be baptized of my baptism? And then he then he answered his own answer to me. He told me, James, you will drink of my cup. And you will be baptized of my baptism. But I have no authority to give you the right or the left when we get to my kingdom. And at this time, it was so confusing. And I'm searching my heart. He tells one of his beloved is going to betray him. This, and I keep having to ask myself, searching deep in my heart, is it I? Is it I? I am Andrew, brother to Simon Peter. The man preferred brought his own brother to the Lord. I am not a gifted man, just an ordinary, average man, much like any one of you. I have done the best I could with the gifts and the talents that I have in order to serve the master. The others, they all call me Andrew, the bringer. For all I ever seem to do is to bring someone else to Jesus. I brought my own brother Peter to the Lord. And now I rejoice in the gradual transformation in his life. I found that lad with the five loaves and the two fish on that day when Jesus fed the 5,000. <laughs> then, just recently, some Greeks came seeking the master. And once again, I was called upon to bring them to Jesus. He must have seen something of value in me that the others have overlooked, for he made me one of his 12 apostles. I have been close to the master ever since. I may not be in the inner circle, as is Peter, but I am not in the outer circle either. I have been a friend and companion to my Lord. What greater gift could possibly be afforded to a fisherman? And now he tells us one of us is to betray him? This is unthinkable. How could he get away with it in his own heart? Could it be? Could it be Andrew the bringer? Is it I? Is it I? come from Galilee. I am from the village of Iscariot in Judea, hence I am known as Judas of Cariot, or Judas Iscariot, the only Judean in the group. But the others, they have confidence in me. They have chosen me as their treasurer. And Jesus, well, he surely has confidence in me. He's chosen me as one of the twelve. But some say that I've appropriated these funds for my own use, and that Jesus' words about the love of money and greed were personally directed at me. Well, of course I complained when Mary washed Jesus' feet with that expensive ointment and perfume. I still think it was a waste of money, and if I conspire with other priests, or if I have 30 pieces of silver on my person, that's my affair. <laughs> I believe in Jesus, but someone has to make him assert himself. As God's Messiah, 
he refuses to make a move. Well, I've made one. He hints that he knows what I've done. He said so as he washed my feet a few moments ago. But what would you do if you wanted him to do something dramatic and startling to usher in his kingdom? If you were in his place, what would you do? Should I ignore his remarks or like the others? Should I piously, self-righteously ask myself, is it I? Is it I? Jesus on my life was simple and straightforward, for he stated, follow me. But that day, it burns in my memory, for you see, I had been seeking the Messiah, God's anointed. Now I knew Jesus was the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Once I was convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, I felt compelled to tell others. But I can't believe one of us would have such blindness as to betray our friend and master. After all, we have been with Jesus when he spoke to thousands. And yet, he seems to speak to each of us. Each of us have witnessed the incredible power of God. And we've heard Jesus explain the teachings of the Holy Scriptures with absolute clarity. After seeing so much, and sensing so much of the divine, it's hard to believe that anyone would betray Jesus. But how could Jesus allow a traitor to remain in our group? And yet, he still breaks bread with that man. Could it be that I will lose courage and deny the master? Is it, Philip? Is it I? <coughs> disciples that Jesus chose to be an apostle. He selected us to be the cornerstone of the new kingdom, just as the twelve tribes were the cornerstone of the old Jewish kingdom. I feel unworthy to be an apostle, but he selected me. I will remember the day he called us to him and gave us authority over unseen spirits. He then commissioned us to go forth in peace, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He told us to be his wise servants and his innocent as doves. He was sending us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. It is enough, he said, that the disciple be like his teacher and a servant of his master. He then gave us a great invitation. Come unto me, all you who are worried and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and deliver from it. But I have a deliverance in my humble heart, and you will find peace in your soul. And he who came to share his burdens and the burdens left upon him, and only one of us would betray him. Which one can it be? The one you least suspect? Which one could it be? <coughs> Philip? Peter? Judas? John? Thaddeus? Is it I? <laughs> the twin, or Thomas called Didymus, which means twin. While I do not look upon life with gloom and despondency, 
I usually demand proof before I believe. I've got to see before committing myself. Yet, I am not a man of doubt, but rather I feel sometimes that I am a man of daring. Well, I recall the day when Mary and Martha sent word to the Lord that their brother Lazarus was dead. Jesus turned to us and he simply said, let us go to him. We all knew of the growing opposition to Jesus and some of the apostles didn't want to go to Bethany. They shrank from the unseen dangers. Yet I remember how I spoke out and rebuked them all by saying, let us also go with him that we may die with him. Why do people remember my doubts and forget my daring? Remember the questions and overlook the affirmations. Remember my fear and forget my faith. I used to go fishing with some of the others and how well I remember the Beatitudes he spoke on the horns of Hatton during the first year of his public ministry. And I can still see him calming the winds on stormy Galilee, oh, wow. healing the sick, curing the disease, opening the eyes of the blind, unstopping the ears of the deaf, cleansing the lepers, and preaching the gospel to the poor. Yet, Opposition has developed and his enemies are determined to destroy him. He would make us God's servants while they would make God their servant. And now he says that even among us, the chosen 12, there is a traitor. Is he speaking of me? Is he referring to me? Is it I? Is it I? called us and we immediately left our father and our boat and we followed him. Since that time I've tried to understand Jesus by loving him. Sometimes I think he is as much of God as will ever possess a human life yet I love him as a person and he returns that love. Sometimes he calls me the beloved disciple. I've shared in his trials as well as his hours of victory. <coughs> I was with him on the mountain of transfiguration and we beheld his glory. Peter and I made the arrangements for the celebration of the Passover here in this upper room tonight because he numbers us within his most close and intimate inner circle. It was to me that he told about a talk with Bartholomew when he spoke those wonderful words, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Someday, I want to write down some of his sayings 
and some of his many wonderful deeds so that others may read them and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And in that believing, have life in his name. Yet he just said that one of us was a betrayer. <clears throat> Who can it be? Surely not my brother James or Peter or Andrew. Could it be John, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Is it I? <laughs> the zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to a group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries known as the zealots. We earned that name because our zeal for God knew no bounds. We called for armed rebellion against Rome. We believed in crushing our enemies beneath our heels and reestablishing the ancient glory of Israel as it was in the days of David and Solomon. But Jesus, Jesus told us of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the human heart, where God reigns supreme. Since I heard him, I changed both my mind and my allegiance. Jesus has shown me that the conquest of the heart is the only true, sincere, and lasting conquest. Thus, I have given him my highest loyalty and my deepest devotion. I have, to put it in military terms, completely and unconditionally surrendered myself to him, to think his thoughts, to love as he loves and whom he loves, to obey as he obeys, and to serve as he serves. Now this surrender hasn't imprisoned me as some might think. Rather it has set me free. For the very first time in my life I am free. I'm not afraid of Rome any longer. Rome may be mighty, but God, God is almighty. Now the Master tells us that there is a spiritual Roman amongst us. One who seeks to conquer through force that which can only be conquered by love. Who can it be? Matthew, the tax collector? The big fisherman or his brother? Or does he suspect me? Since I am the only former zealot among us, can it be? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Fishing on the Sea of Galilee one afternoon, casting our nets into the sea, when Jesus walked by and said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We immediately left our nets and followed him. One morning he said, Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. I said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Well, we caught so many fish that we had to summon other nearby boats 
to help contain the catch. When we reached the shore, I fell at Jesus' feet and cried out, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. But he told us that thereafter we would only be fishing for men. In fact, he even changed my name from Simon to Peter, which means the rock. And when I confessed him as the Christ, the son of the living God near Caesarea Philippi, he said, on this rock will I build my church. But then a moment later, when I protested his going to Jerusalem to suffer death <coughs> at the hands of evil men, he rebuked me and said, get thee behind me, Satan. So I'm a mixture of good and evil, of godliness and devilishness. Tonight, when he said, one of you will betray me, I promised to follow him even to the death. But he warned me that tonight, before the rooster crows twice, I will have denied him three times. Even though the others call me the big fisherman, in his presence, I feel small and unworthy. Will I deny him tonight? before the rooster crows? And if I do, what will he do? Will he disown me? Will he deny me? Will he close the doors of the kingdom to me? Was he referring to me when he said, one of you will betray me? If I knew who the scoundrel was, I'd pierce his heart with this knife I hold in my hand but maybe it would be my own heart that I would pierce. God grant that it not be so. Yet I keep wondering and saying to myself, Lord, is it I? Is it I? searching yourselves and each other to place blame and you're finding guilt but I say to you it is not because of your sins that this will happen but for the forgiveness of your sins and not just for you but for everyone who eats from this table my father provided this raised to life by your hand we thank you, O Lord, for your provision in this, the bread of life. Take and eat, for this is my body, which has been broken for you. We thank you, O Lord, for this fruit of the vine, gathered from the many hills around us into one cup just as we are gathered together in you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink from it, all of you. Take this bread and this cup and serve them as a witness of the glory and love of our Father God. Invite everyone to this table and do this in remembrance of me. So this table is for you as well. Come, all of you.
The table is ready, and my disciples will serve you just as I have served them. Take, eat, remember, and believe. <laughs>